Thanks, everyone. Oh, sorry. I didn't get a wink yet. <laughs> okay, everybody, thanks for coming. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, it's Tuesday, June 28th. It's Planning Commission for Santa Quin City. I uh, just want to start with an invocation or inspirational thought. Um, Commissioner Nixon is going to go ahead and give us an inspirational thought. This is a quote by Jan Gell. It says, first life then spaces, then buildings. The other way around will never work. Very good, thank you so much. Is anyone willing to lead us in the pledge? Okay, go ahead, thanks. Please join me to pledge allegiance. I pledge I allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so tonight we've got six items on the agenda, actually seven including the minutes. Uh, the first item is McDonald's rear elevation sign. The second is Scenic Ridge Estates preliminary review. The third is Stratton Acres preliminary review. The fourth is a public hearing uh, on the land use tables and definitions relating to the Main Street Business District Zone. The fifth item is a public hearing for the agricultural related um, amendments and the sixth is detached accessory dwelling units so uh, we've got two public hearings item four and five uh, right now I guess we'll go ahead and open a public forum we'll open the public forum at 701 looks like I do have two people that wanted to speak tonight this is going to be anything outside of what's on the agenda so if you want to speak on a particular agenda item there will be time for four and five, um, but this is basically anything outside of that. I have two people that have signed up. Cameron Spencer. Oh, no. Was that attendance? Yeah. Okay, no mm -hmm. problem. Jessica Mitchell. Um, this is in regards to spaces. Okay. Is that something I should lead us? Yeah, so if you, I'll give you, um, you some time in just a second. After he does like an explanation, then we'll let you get up. Okay. Is there anybody else that would like to speak during the public forum? Okay, we'll co close that at 7.02. First item, uh, discussion and possible action item is McDonald's rear elevation sign. All right, this is coming to the Planning Commission because code says that if M McDonald's wants an, a sign on their rear, rear elevation, it needs to have approval from the Planning Commission. Um, there's no concerns with the sign that they have. It meets all the, the sign requirements. And uh, uh, yeah, I, we could go into details if you want. It's pretty, probably about what you'd expect on a McDonald's. So um, nothing is is of any concern. The signs are, are um, uh, underneath the, the square footage that they're able to have. So um, there's really not a whole lot more to say on this, it's just that technicality is that Planning Commission approves signs on on rear, rear elevations so. okay this is an administrative decision and we are the authority so would this will be a motion to approve is there any discussion on this item can you show how it faces on the lot mm -hmm. like. so it's anticipated that the um, the front Shit. elevation would be where the drive up windows are this is what's going to be facing Main Street um, and, and this elevation, oh, sorry, this elevation here is what's going to be facing north, uh, is where the parking lot is and where a lot of people would probably enter the McDonald's. So this would be considered the rear, eleva el rear elevation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're wanting to capture the freeway traffic. They're, they want to have signs and on all sides the of the building. So, yeah. So. Okay. Okay, I'll look for a motion. Okay. I would make a motion that we approve the proposed McDonald's signs. Very good. I'll make a second. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll have a roll call vote. Commissioner Hoffman? Aye. Commissioner Romero? Aye. Commissioner Waite? Aye. Commissioner McNuff? Aye. Commissioner Nixon? Aye. Commissioner Lance? Aye. Motion carries. 
Okay, next item on the agenda is Scenic Ridge Estates Preliminary Review. All right, so this is a, a proposed subdivision which is up on the, the east side of, of the city at approximately 430 South and uh, 1200 East. Uh, it's proposed that there be eight single family lots, a uh, total of 4.76 acres. Uh, this property is located in the R12 uh, PUD zone. That's, that's, that's the name of the zone. This isn't a PUD. Uh, uh, the area around it was a part of a PUD, but this, this is not a PUD in the sense that it's got a development agreement with it. Um, so you would look at it more as, as the standard R12 requirements. Uh, again, they have the, the eight lots. Uh, it's also in the hillside overlay. Um, here is the layout of those lots. Um, it would include this road that would, would connect um, uh, and have the two points of access. It's a standard subdivision. There's, there's a, you know, the, the lots are at least 12,000 square feet. Uh, this lot eight is, is a little bit larger. That was, that was one we had to work with them on. Um, they, th the intention there is, is that it, in order for it to be platted and, and not to be a remnant piece or an island, it needed to be a developable lot. Uh, their anticipation is, is not to, to build on that lot for the time being, but uh, they, they've got other land that they would probably uh, include that lot um, or a, a, an amendment to sub further subdivide that lot into two or three lots uh, in the future as they, they do other uh, development uh, further to the east. The reason why they're not doing that development is because it's, it's high enough in elevation that they're not able to get the, the services for water. It's below the uh, pressure, um, the water pressure line. So that's why they, they are starting off with these first eight lots. Um, this is a <clears throat> this is a preliminary plan. So this this uh, uh, the action for the planning commission tonight would be to make a recommendation, um, and then it would be forwarded to the city council, where the city council would be uh, the land use authority for approving a, a preliminary plan. After the preliminary plan, then. Uh, uh, there would be subsequent final plats. I think it's expected that, that this would probably be all under one final plat. Um, and that, that final plat approval is taken care of by the, the Development Review Committee, or DRC. And so uh, this, this would be the last time the Planning Commission sees this. Uh, there's not any significant um, uh, issues or red lines that, that really need to be mentioned. There's, there's some red lines still, uh, and as is customary, uh, condition would be that planning and engineering red lines be approved, but nothing of, of that's too substantial that uh, w would uh, uh, cause any concerns for it to move forward and, and have the uh, city council consider the subdivision. So I think that's probably the sufficient uh, introduction and I can answer any questions that you have um, um, if you have them. I think there was uh, some questions regarding a water tank. I think in mm -hmm. the notes in the memo there were some there was some information. Do you want to just summarize that a little bit? Yeah. So for for the eight lots that they're they're requesting in this submittal, there's no need for an additional water tank. That would be for the property that they own to the east. If they wanted to develop that, then there needs to be some significant infrastructure improvements, including a water tank. Um, so that's that's why it's proposed the way that it is, is they're, they're, they're wanting to develop the land that is in a current pressure zone where they can get adequate uh, uh, water. Okay. Okay, and is the, the road, sidewalks, all of that connecting? Uh -huh. And that's supposed to be developed along with those eight lots? Like they'll have to have the road, sidewalks? Yep. All that infrastructure, okay. That's correct. Okay, we have we don't have a public hearing on this, but just a quick question on that: Where's that angle going to? Is that it? So yeah, that would be. I mean, that there may be a potential in the future for for this road to be extended to the east. Again, they own all the property that's around this, and, and if they'd like to develop that in the future, then uh, it's expected that there may be, uh, you know, further uh, access created uh, to other parts of the property. But for the time being. It's, it's just this, this right angle uh, road that would connect uh, the existing 300 south down here to, uh, what is that, 300 south? Um, 
Yeah, three hundred so. So, yeah, that's um, again what what you see up on the screen is what what this particular phase, if you will, of this development would be. Uh, future development of the property would again need to to couldn't happen until there's there's uh, uh, other needs that are addressed. Okay, and the open space behind lots three and four. Mm -hmm. That's not really required, but they're keeping it. So it is or, required. All because of the hillside. Because this okay. isn't a hillside uh, development overlay. Okay. Uh, there is a 10% open space requirement for like active recreation. Okay. Uh, there is a, a trail. That, there's a, uh, in this area, there's a, um, a, a wash, okay. if you will. Okay. Um, and it's, it's anticipated that there would be a trail along that that would extend um, okay. you know, north from here so uh, for this particular phase that's the the ten percent that they would provide to, to meet that requirement and and uh, yeah I okay. it, it would be something that we'd ex expect to to be perpetuated as as further development happens on that property okay I think we'll give miss Mitchell an opportunity to speak she's got to stand up and speak her name state your name in the, in microphone, the microphone please just so for the minutes they can have re everything Okay, my name is Jessica Mitchell. I apologize, I'm coming from work, my husband's coming from work, and we brought our kids from T-Ball. Okay. So if it's okay with you, we might sneak out after to take them home and get them bathed. <laughs> and um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here and to listen to how much discussion is had about these things. Um, it's nice to put faces with names that we've seen, and um, I'm just very grateful to hear you guys carefully considering the things that are brought before you. Um, with that, I wanted to just read this comment. We understand that development needs to and will occur in Santa Quin. What we are asking of the city and those we have elected is to develop these areas responsibly and with transparency towards the citizens. Regarding transparency, <coughs> In an effort to understand the intent of the development, I emailed former city manager Ben Reeves nearly two years ago. I received a response from him on November 17th, 2020, indicating that this development would depend on the installation of a new water tank. Quote, it is my understanding that over the years, many interested parties have contacted the city about these parcels. However, due to water pressure zones, this area is not yet developed because a new water tank would be needed, end quote. Regarding responsible development, I would like to point out the following. Recently, the city has reported that they have water for pressurized irrigation for the new development. However, it seems that there are some East Bench homes that are still on culinary water. Um, it would be helpful to identify which areas on the East Bench, if they are truly on culinary water, still use this for their pressurized irrigation and why that is still the case. Additionally, since the need for a water tank was identified 20 years ago, and again in my email from Reeves, perhaps you can share what improvements have been made to ensure sufficient water for current residents of the East Bench. Another change I have seen regarding the, the development is moving a debris basin directly to the east at the far end of 300 South. This is behind Louis, Luis and Marcy Bedoya's home. Previously, the debris basin in question was located further south. May we please have the debris basin remain more southern so that the new residents may plan accordingly for the implications of a debris basin and not the residents who have previously settled the area. And finally, please continue as, as a planning commission to emphasize the need for green space for our youngest community members. They may not vote yet. They may not read comments into council meetings as public record, although they wanted to today. <laughs> But this impacts them perhaps more than us as homeowners. I have an eight-year-old and six-year-old. They have spent the last three years hopping our fence and running up into the mountain. There was a large fort we called Boompa's Fort after my father who helped assemble, assemble it from discarded scrub pine branches um, when he was visiting us from Indiana. Last Halloween saw the most massive version of ghosts in the graveyard that I have ever seen. And this January, the neighbor kids gathered along an old deer trail to go sledding in the fresh mountain 
powder. Please hold the developers accountable for the green space they have been asked to provide. I am pleading with the Planning Commission to consider comments by your neighbors as you approve conceptual plans. Please communicate with us accurate information as well as frequent updates. We want to build a better community together. And this will be signed Jessica Mitchell as well as Melanie Moore Smith. Thank you so much. Do you want to discuss any of that? Do you have any response to, to that? Yeah. So the green, the green space is in that 10%, uh -huh. correct? Yep. And then where's the proposed uh, basin? So there, there's basin? not really a proposed basin. There's There's been some uh, uh, very preliminary conceptual uh, locations that have been talked about. And basins aren't, aren't necessarily located because it's going to be more impactful to some residents versus another. We put basins are, are are based on engineering studies of where the flow from the mountains comes from, and so we want to put the basins in where it's going to address the flow uh, the most, uh, and that may be next to existing residences. It may may not be, but those are are uh, uh, studies and engineering geotechnical type studies that are going to need to happen in order for us to to pinpoint exactly where that's at. We know general areas where where that's at in its development and as uh, other things occur, we're trying to do our best to preserve uh, property because of the the you know nine plus million dollars that we we, we uh, uh, nine million dollar grant that we got that cannot be used for property acquisition. It can only be used for the actual work to to construct those retention basins. So uh, yeah, that's that's all still to be determined. We don't have pinpointed locations, but we have general ideas. And and when when stuff like this happens, we do our best to try and preserve land. Uh, or negotiate with developers so that we can, uh, you know, do it in a way that's that's most uh, advantageous for the city. Um, um, so, uh, let's see other things that you brought up. Culinary water. Oh, so the water situation. Yeah, um, I can't speak to what what uh, Ben Reeves said about it. I think his intention was that generally that a lot of that property does need more infrastructure in order to be developed, but. The pressure line is the pressure line, and, and, and these proposed lots are under that pressure line and still could uh, receive uh, service uh, um, based on their location. Uh, there, there's a number of areas in the city that still are on culinary water. Most of Summit Ridge is still on culinary water. We're actually in the process of building a, uh, an, another uh, water tank over there so that they can get access to, to pressurized irrigation and, and, and uh, so the city can, can use that. Um, so yeah, there there are some areas where, where it ends up being that way, and as as uh, further infrastructure is developed, as development uh, happens and, and helps to to build more water tanks and things like that, it makes the entire system as a whole work better and provides those opportunities where we can convert uh, those those homes that are on culinary over to pressurized irrigation. But uh, in terms of, of having the the service, uh, yeah, this 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 uh, subdivision does meet all the requirements of our code. There's been uh, extensive uh, engineering, not just from, from our own staff, but we've had uh, uh, consultants that have, uh, engineering consultants that have done studies and, and really, uh, yeah, we've, we've gone, this has probably been a, what, a two or three year process that we've, we've tried to work through all the, the, the different um, uh, complexities, if you will. Obviously, the higher you get up on the hillside, the, the more that there's, there's gonna be uh, engineering and, and uh, and, and those types of, of uh, issues that need to be addressed. So um, does that address all the points that you, you covered? So they, they haven't been designed yet. Okay. They, they've had, what you've probably seen is I think there's general areas that have been identified as, as needing that. But in terms of the actual design of it, there very well may be one here. I'm probably not the best to speak to it because our engineers are more involved with that. But I do know that they haven't gone as far as designing the actual basins and, and the actual size and location of them. So uh, again, that's something that is, is you know, we're looking forward to be able to, to utilize that federal, federal grant money so that we can protect the, the homes that are on the east bench. That's that's something that is, is only of, of benefit. I know sometimes those types of things may not be the, the most um, desirable to, to have next to you, but uh, 
it's it's something that is certainly a need and and it's it's going to protect the residents from from future debris flows if if we see that again hopefully we we uh we don't have those types of, of situations but anytime there's a fire there's inevitably mm -hmm. going to be debris flows and, and we want to do things to preserve that all right commissioners is there any discussion here I was curious on lot eight, it says that space was reserved for a future water pressure tank or pump. Lot eight? Yeah. I'm sorry, on which map or, or page? Yeah, that or? one. Because how it angles around, it says there's a buildable lot. And so the space that's buildable is good, but then it says lot eight is within a future water pressure zone. Right, that mm. means this current zone doesn't meet that. that so that, that's mm -hmm. partly why they have that. They would have loved to initially made that into three lots. Yeah. But okay. they couldn't because there's portions of that area that, that can't it get the water wouldn't. pressure. Will you scroll okay. down to sheet seven? That shows exactly where the elevation line is and why it is the way it is. Why it didn't? Okay. See that elevation line right there on sheet seven? Oh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's the water zone elevation line. Okay. So yeah, that, that was something that we had to get creative because they wanted to put a lot here and they wanted to just preserve this area as you know a future okay. lot. But our code doesn't allow for remnant parcels and particularly since there's a, a dedicated road that's going to kind of you know, uh, mm -hmm. wrap around that and, and that would truly make it like this remnant island. So we had to think through how they could, could make you know, that, that buildable area that's, that's shown as lot A, this area right here. Um, and again, like I say, their intention is not to actually build at this point. It's just, uh, it was kind of a technicality that, that this couldn't be recorded unless it was a buildable lot. Uh, okay. They couldn't just record something that had a parcel or a remnant parcel. So they'll probably hold on to that. And then as, as you know, down the road, I don't even know how long that would be, but uh, when, when uh, further infrastructure is, is constructed, then it will change change things and allow them to, to be able to, to get a couple more lots there and, and, and be able to service that area. But for the time being, they can't service that, and that's why they, they've created that. And again, it's not intended for that to be a lot. It just needs to be done that way because technically we don't allow for a remnant parcel. Okay. I mean, in some ways you could say all this is remnant over yeah. here, but it's, it's mm -hmm. remnant like you know, on the outskirts. But once we have a, a dedicated road that comes around it, then it's a little bit different story. Yeah. And the corner is set that way because they're expecting to do, put a street through one or that way or the other. Uh -huh. yeah, they've, they've had plans that to, to access uh, the rest of their property of, of having a road. And there probably need to be a, a culvert or a bridge in order to get over that, that drainage mm -hmm. goalie to, to access the other side and, you know, the lots that, that they would probably look at in there in the future would probably be pretty big because of, of some of the geologic uh, characteristics of that area, so. Okay. Okay. There is no public hearing here, but we are looking for a uh, forward to a recommendation to forward to the city council. So I'll look for, look for a motion. I'll make a motion to recommend approval of the Scenic Ridge Estate subdivision with the following conditions that all the planning and engineering red lines be addressed. And I'll second it. Very good. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Lance, aye. Commissioner Nixon? Aye. Commissioner McNuff? Aye. Commissioner Waite? Aye. Commissioner Romero? Aye. Commissioner Hoffman? Aye. Uh, motion carries. Very good. It was really good discussion. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Okay, agenda item number three is Stratton Acres preliminary review. There is no public hearing on this. I think we held it quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, we'll go ahead and open discussion and let Jason lead us. Yeah, so this is a, this is a, a, a standard subdivision as well. Uh, this is located in the R10 zone, so all the lots in this would be uh, a minimum of 10,000 square feet. The subdivision is located at approximately Royal Land Drive and 200 East. Uh, it's proposed to have 37 single-family lots on 12.39 acres. Um, and this is, yeah, it's, I say it's a standard subdivision. It's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. 
uh, as you can see, uh, the one that thing that might have could be mentioned on this one is is there was some offsite things that needed to be um, uh, addressed, uh, easements and things like that. Uh, there were some gaps and some parcels, and and uh, I know that that our staff has has worked hard with the applicant to address a lot of those things. Uh, those are still needing to be addressed, but. Those are things that would take care, be taken care of and finalized at a final plat stage. So for purposes of the preliminary, uh, they've been able to, to address all the other requirements that are, are in our code for a development like this. Uh, again, the, the standard subdivisions are a little bit more straightforward because uh, it's, you know, meets the minimum zoning requirements and, and, and that. Uh, it'll create some, some better street connectivity in the area. So. The map you're looking at uh, to the left would be north, mm -hmm. um, and so. So uh, we're second east. Uh, second east would be right here. That top road, sweet, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know if there's really a whole lot more that I can say there. Um, again, it's it's size wise. What are these lots? They're all at least ten thousand square feet. I think they're pretty pretty close to that uh, for most of them, but. Yeah, as you scroll through there, they're so right. About a quarter acre. Just, just above. Yep. Yeah, it's about a quarter acre. So as you can see, they're all just a, a little over uh, 10,000 square feet. There's a few over here that are a little bit larger, but um, yeah. I just have two questions. Uh huh. First one on the demo plan, they're talking about removing existing irrigation. Is that going to affect any of the farmland around there? No, any any sort of development that happens, uh, yeah, it, it can't. It, it's going to be part and added to to the bigger system of the city, and so yeah, it's it's not going to take away any sort of, of service for any surrounding properties. And then the, there's a retention basin shown on there that's on the school property. I think if you go to the, I can't remember which one it was, but it shows the retention basin, kind of shows running down the street and then going into a retention basin on the school property. Right yeah, right there in the lower right. Yep, yep. So that's probably something that they, they've worked out with with uh, the school. That was one of the things they needed to do for the offsite was was get utilities run so so that it works. That went through school district property, and so. There's, there's things that need to be coordinated with the school district. I'm sure this is something that, that is part of, of addressing that. Um, uh, yeah, and so, and I remember on one iteration you had like R tanks and stuff, but that you got rid of that because it's all gonna be going to this basin. So, yep, that's that's how they would meet the storm drainage requirements is, is the, the collaboration and the uh, negotiating that they done with the school district. So is it, there is a condition required, or I mean, there is a condition needed for city Red lines, engineering yeah. and red lines yep. still. Just like I like say, normal. as customary, we have those those red lines that are still there. But in terms of of um, you know substance, they're they're relatively minor. But they've they've been able to meet all the requirements. Uh, again, planning and zoning perspective, it's really straightforward. There was a few um, uh, things from more of an engineering technical standpoint, really the offsite utilities. But again, they've uh, I talked with John Lindell right before this meeting, and he said, "Yep, they're." They've been able to, to demonstrate and show that they're they're uh, going to be able to meet all that. Technically, there'll be easements and things that need to be finalized, and and they'll need to do that before they get any sort of final plat approval. So, yeah. or I guess it could happen beyond that, but uh, uh, those will be things before they can record that they need to, to get uh, taken care of. So, in order to develop these lots, they have to put the retention basin in, mm -hmm. correct? Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. In order okay. for any of the the any these lots to be built on uh, they need to do all those subdivision improvements and that does uh, include uh, having stormwater requirements met so that road right there second east is pretty narrow and I that's gonna add a lot of traffic going up second east mm -hmm. up to Maine that's basically the only way to get up there right now unless they go backwards a little bit by the canal to go up to fourth east um, are they gonna be widening that road at all or making they're, they're going to be building it to the standard that's in accordance with our transportation master plan. I, I can't mm -hmm. remember the, the I width. feel like they would have to widen it because it's very narrow. You can barely get. But I don't know as they own the all car. the way to the canal. So 
Yeah. Is that a half plus ten row Jason, or is it a? Three I row? I don't think it is. It, it is so. Do we still allow half plus ten rolls? I thought we got rid of those. Well, we, we considered it at one time of, of not allowing them, but we, we didn't go that far. So we, we still allow. But half plus ten refers to they need to build uh, half of the asphalt plus ten feet. So that's not showing the full width. Um, but again, um, any sort of extra width that, that would need to be done on that road would, would be something that the city would need to do. But again, we haven't identified uh, Second East as a road that, that needs to be widened. Uh, I think the collector, the north-south collector arterial roads are Center Street and then 400 East. Those are the ones that are going to be the uh, the, the Well, generally, roads. but right there is 2nd East. Everybody in that neighborhood goes right up 2nd East there from, it's the main area. And hits every pothole on either side. Uh-huh. And, yeah. it's a, and it's kind of out of your way to go over to Center Street or 4th East at that point. And so if you pull up the, just like Google Maps and look at that mm -hmm. road, is the width that's by the school going to continue through this new area that's yeah, being Yeah, because that's a nicer width, but the no, back there by the orchard, it's not. Ten row. They're not going to build the full width of the roadway. But is the right-of-way going to still be there? That's what I'm asking. Is the, is the width going to be there so that it can be built later? So they're going to give us the right-of-way that they're obligated to, to give us. The other half of the road and the right-of-way associated with it won't come until the other side of the road develops. Which is farmland right now. No, but if you can, – can you just pull it out and I'll show you what I'm – Right there. Mm -hmm. So see the road right there by the school. Mm -hmm. So is that going to line going to continue north? So that that is the side of the road that they're developing on. So that's that's the uh, side that they're going to improve. So it will be widened, widened to that. So point it will then. be widened mm -hmm. to where they're approving. Yep. Okay. And they'll put in a sidewalk to continue there. Correct? Yeah, because it's basically yep. like a one lane. Okay. Right now. That was my concern. So it's not going to go all the way to the canal. No, yeah, they're, they're responsible for all the infrastructure improvements that it's along the frontage of their property. But they right. don't own all the way to the canal, I guess, is the point. There's like a section make. right next yeah. to the yeah. canal. Yep. Yeah, so they can't go connect Ginger Gold because they don't own that last part. So it's not going to fix everything, but it's going to be in a, a little bit better. better. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> right. But it will widen that road out some. Yeah, for, yeah. yeah exactly. Because okay. that's a lot to of houses to go that. on that narrow road and it'd be scary. Yeah. Very good point. Thank you for pulling that up. Huh? So that sidewalk that's shown there should continue on. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. Okay. And then into the Hive Homes development to the west, it will connect. Right, right. So, yeah, the, as development happens, it does create better connectivity, um, not just in roads, but it, it'll, it'll uh, uh, you know, they'll, they'll build the sidewalks and stuff associated with it as well. As long as the sidewalk doesn't jog east for a few feet and then continue north, I'm cool with that. <laughs> yeah, it actually does jog east just a little bit, mm -hmm. then continue north. Yeah, there's there's a slight bend. So you can see it right there. You can kind of see jog. right there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's mm -hmm. probably the existing road, and so they'll widen it and then and um, and provide the uh, sidewalk. And so it goes to about the end of the second lot there, and then it continues north. You can see right. that jog right there. Right just yeah. a slight jog. Well, the side go down the sidewalk right below, right there where your arrow is now. Mm -hmm. Line right below that's the sidewalk. Right. Oops, sorry. So it does kind of jog east a little bit and then continue yeah. on. You can see that little bit of a bend right there. So that road will narrow slightly for now. Hmm. All right. Compared to, compared to what's on the east side of the school. Mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. um, eventually when the new school property is developed, it will we'll get widened even we'll get more. Widened out, yeah. As long as we widen it out. Yeah. yeah it's going to be terrible if they don't. Which section is the future school property right so it's to the east of it kind of the right across the east it's not kitty corner or anything i'm just trying to imagine it in my brain yep so again north is to the east right or north is to the left i'm looking at north is to the east <laughs> satellite image right now so i can uh, <laughs> visualize it that's funny okay well you guys have anything else okay. All right, no public hearing on this one. This one will be a recommendation forwarded to the city council as well. So I will look for a motion. And then we do have engineering, uh, city engineering and red lines as well still. Mm -hmm. so. hmm. 
Okay. I'll make a motion to recommend the approval of the Stratton Acres subdivision with the following conditions that all planning and engineering red lines be addressed. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you. We'll do a roll call vote here. Commissioner Hoffman. Aye. Commissioner Romero. Aye. Commissioner Waite. Aye. Commissioner McNuff. Aye. Commissioner Nixon. Aye. Commissioner Lance. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. That was a really good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Agenda item number four is a public hearing uh, on the land use tables and definitions related to the Main Street Business District. This is something we've been working on for quite a while. Yep. Yeah. So should, should I open a public hearing or do you no, uh, want to go ahead and then I'll do I can it. probably do a little introduction okay. and then Very we good. can do a public hearing. Um, so yeah. I think everybody's pretty familiar with with where we're at with this one. Uh, I've I've been working with with our legal counsel Brett Rich to to fine tune any any language that he saw an issue with. Um, one of, one of the things one of the main things that he he addressed was if you remember we we were looking at the alcoholic beverage uh, uh, class A. Actually, there is a typo right there that I can take care of. That should be crossed out. But instead of having them as Class A licenses, he took the word license out and and then called them uh, uh, Class B establishments. That way, uh, the the definition for those licenses uh, are are referenced in state code. But um, that way, it keeps kind of the intent of of those different um, categories. But instead of them licenses, which the cities not you know repealed language to where we get involved with those licenses it just changed them to establishments to make them more of a um, on the ground type mm -hmm. of a, a land use right so um, yeah there's a couple of things there I might need to I need to cross out that license there and I may need to uh, add an establishment there sorry <laughs> there, there's a lot of red and blue on this one and it's, <laughs> yeah. it's been kind of a headache so again, the, the whole intent with this this is not necessarily to do any sort of drastic, you know, uh, shuffling of land uses or creating new land uses. Um, I guess there's there's maybe some domino effects of, of some of the things that we've done here, um, and we can talk about that in a little bit. But really, the intent of this was was to try and clean up this particular section of code, make sure that every land use that was listed in the table has a definition, and the definitions are clear that land uses are, are clear. Um, the, the Planning Commission has, I guess, you could say, uh, with some substance, um, indicated some specific land uses uh, that they didn't want to see, which I think it was insinuating where they weren't allowed anyway because they, they weren't listed on the land use table. Uh, but there were things that the Planning Commission did specifically add uh, so that they could, they could uh, um, clearly indicate that those things are, are not permitted in that particular zone. Um, as you can see, a lot of these definitions, we've, we've uh, just cleaned up a few things. Um, I'll come, up, come back up to something there. Uh, there's just some clarifying language about, about uh, you know, in our code, we've uh, basically hotels and motels have the same meaning. Um, that was just a clarification there. Some new definitions for land uses that we had that, that were pretty straightforward, like a public building. Um, we did create a, a definition for a restaurant that is a drive-through, um, wedding chapel, <laughs> things of that mm -hmm. nature. Uh, so that's that's definitions. And then as we come down into the the actual section of code, um, you know, working with with legal counsel, we never really define what the Main Street Business District Zone is. Um, and so there's just some very straightforward language there that that indicates that the Main Street Business District Zone is the central business district, the Main Street commercial district, and the Main Street residential district. If you remember, mm -hmm. we used to call these areas. It didn't really make sense to call them areas because we called it the Main Street business districts mm -hmm. zone. And so just like I say, some cleanup there that, that um, makes it a little bit more consistent with itself. Um, and we decided to call them districts because it was probably the easiest way to do it because of the name of the zone and also because uh, every, you know, we, we often refer to the central business district as the CBD and adding district to, to main, main Street Commercial and Main Street Residential didn't change the acronyms that we're all so used to. So uh, not that that's the most important thing in this, but uh, 
they're still the MSC, MSR, and CBD, uh, but technically they are, are now districts instead of areas. So again, you see that just in the table, uh, you know, just little errors that, you know, Main Street commercial districts, it's Main Street business districts. And then really a lot of the other work was, was on this land use table. As you can see, uh, we, we replaced uh, uh, language related to licensing to establishments. Uh, there's some of these, these uh, land uses that are, are, weren't in the code before that we put in there to, to uh, give a little bit more of a uh, straightforward uh, expectation of that particular land use. Uh, again, there's some of these that I'll come back to. Um, heavy commercial we put in there is not permitted. Um, some of these are just labeled in a way that wasn't consistent with, with how they were shown in the definition. So we didn't have a definition for commercial parking lot or garage. Well, I guess we do for garage. But instead of having two definitions in one land use car category, we, we, we separated that out and just, you know, consistent with the definition for parking lot. A um, uh, couple of the things here, you know, commercial repair, repair services. The reason why that's all taken out is because we didn't have a definition for commercial repair services. Uh, I guess, you, you know, we could all insinuate what repair services are, but, but from a legal standpoint and, and as, you know, someone comes in and says that's, that's what they want to do, I don't have a definition to go off of. So um, we have some other land use uh, definitions that are similar to that, so it was thought to take that out. Um, again, more terms that, that just weren't defined in our code, uh, took them out. More terms that we do have definitions for, but we wanted to um, uh, provide a little bit more clarification on whether or not those land uses are allowed or not. Uh, again, going down through here, uh, instead of government offices, it's down below in public building, um, so on and so forth. I don't know, need to go through every every little detail. And again, we've, we've looked at this several times, and there's not a whole lot that's probably changed from the last time you saw this down there. Uh, a lot of the changes were related to the alcohol beverage and, and some of the, you know, more high level um, characteristics of the zone and, and terminology in that. So one thing that, that I, I would bring up, because uh, I know in, in past meetings we've had some, some questions and concerns about uh, some of the services that are related to, to uh, automobiles. Um, so in the definition up above, uh, we have retail sales and services, and I think, um, uh, there we go, retail sales and services. There was uh, some explanation that I was added there that, that came from another definition that probably fit more in this, and then there was, you know, self-service or full-service full car wash that we felt like maybe was, was more applicable to, to automotive service and repair. Um, that was more of us trying to clean it up and make make it so it, it was in, in a category or in a definition that made more sense. Uh, again, some of this was just assumptions that in the land use table, we never did have uh, any automotive service and repair, whether major or minor, listed in there. That's why it's blue and underlined is because it wasn't even on the table before. Uh, however, obviously, we, we do have some automotive service type businesses that are on Main Street. And those are perfectly fine to, to continue on uh, doing business that way. Those would be considered legal non-conforming uses. However, I guess the, 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 there, it's still a, a worthy question to, to pose of do you want automotive service and repair minor included in the Main Street Business District Zone? Uh, maybe it's not necessarily in all three districts, but it's only in, in MSC. Um, mm -hmm. I think that probably consistent with other, other uh, land uses that are or aren't allowed in the MSR, that probably would make sense. But that's something I know has been brought up in the past and, and something that's probably, uh, uh, you know, was, wasn't an anticipated, like, impactful change that was made. It was really, we're trying to, to just clarify things. But um, as has been discussed previously, that might be something the Planning Commission wants to discuss and, and maybe potentially allow in the uh, Main Street commercial um, and CBD or w whatever you want to recommend. So, yeah, after several weeks of, of having this on our agenda, this is this is I think uh, pretty pretty darn clean and, and close to, to move forward. There's a couple of those little uh, Scrivener errors I'll take care of. Um, but uh, yeah, with that said, this is a legislative action, and, and the uh, the planning commission uh, we did set a public hearing for this tonight. I think part of it was just to make sure that if there was any changes that the public was aware of any of those changes that were made 
So we do have a public hearing that you'll hold, and then after that, um, this will be your recommendation to make to the, the city council. Okay, thank you, Jason, for that. We'll go ahead and open the public hearing tonight at 744. And is there anyone that would like to speak to this? Okay, we'll just have you come up and state your name and go ahead and let us know what you think. So I'm Andrea Lee. I've been a resident of Santa Quin for like 20 years. And then I've also lived in the Main Street residential zone for about 15 years. So I've felt the growth and the change. And I know that everything's changing. And when I go through in the MSR zone, there's not a lot of things that are allowed when I know that the master plan is to kind of make that your transition business district. Mm -hmm. So as you guys are changing this, I'd like to see more things maybe added in that zone to allow me to sell my property so that I can move because I felt the pressure of the city uh, growing and I'm going to be right next to a gas station at this point. So, and, you know, I know in the future, I know that the, uh, trailer court is C1, so that's all commercial, and I'm going to be stuck right in the middle in a Main Street residential. So for someone to come build a house there, it's probably not going to work. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see some of the things that are on the MSR zoning maybe go more commercial. And speaking of automotive, I'd like to see those things still stay here in the commercial district as well. Mm -hmm. So Okay. Well, thank you so much for yep. coming. Is there anything specifically you'd like to see? Just just going through the zonings, and I haven't seen the updated list, but, I mean, there's not a whole lot in residential, and maybe just make it more commercial-friendly if, if that's the way we're going to go with the city, okay. which I think right where my house is is the first block of Main Street there. Right. So I'm going to be mm -hmm. stuck in the middle of uh, a bunch of commercial and, you know, I'm limited on what I can sell my lot for. Right. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for Thanks. coming. Okay. Nobody else wants to speak, I'm assuming, unless, unless Jeff's ready to say something. I'll close the public hearing at 746, and we'll open discussion on this item. The defined difference between major and minor automotive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so good question. We can look at our code. Uh, so if we go to the definition section, which is 10.08, uh, automotive, no, I skipped it. Automotive service and repair. So major is an establishment primarily engaged in the repair or maintenance of motor vehicles, trailers, or similar large mechanical equipment, including paint, body, and fender and engine and engine parts, provided it is conducted within a completely enclosed building. Accessory activities may include a car wash service and complies with the provisions of Santa Quin City Code 1048060 or obtains a conditional use per permit thereunder. That's major. Minor is an establishment primarily engaged in the repair or maintenance of motor vehicles, trailers, or similar mechanical equipment, including brake, muffler, tire repair, and change. Uh, lubrication, tune-up, safety inspections, and emission testing, detailing shops, overhaul, or transmission work, but does not include an establishment that qualifies as a major, homo uh, major automotive service and repair facility, and provided it is conducted within a completely enclosed building, accessory activities may include a car wash service that complies with the provisions of the Santa Quin City Code 10.48.060, or obtains a conditional use permit thereunder. So, um, those are the definitions of what's what's included there. Um, okay. Is that still too vague? I I wouldn't think that it's. I think that's pretty specific. So currently, Judd's is major. Is that correct? I think yeah. it sounds like minor. It's minor. Yeah. Because they're they're not doing paint or they're body or fender. Body, but they, mm -hmm. are doing, they are doing engine and they engine, are doing parts. engine and parts. I I think that there's a chance that it would be major. Is what I would probably look at it as. I so mean, like a big old tires, a, a a quick mm -hmm. lube, a, you know, a place like that, an emissions uh, specialty type of a place would would be more of a minor. Those are all minor. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think any sort of a, a repair shop where they actually do work on the engine 
is is major. So yeah, I would think that the Jeds would be that. Uh, obviously, so they'll be legal non-conforming if this moves forward. Right, right, right. right. Yep. Mm -hmm. That 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 applies uh, no matter what. Where where uh, you know the city cannot take zoning rights out from underneath people. They they will be able to continue that. Uh, and that, that use runs with the land. Even if they sold the, the property as a auto mechanic to somebody else, that runs with the land. They could potentially lose their legal non-conforming status if they change the use there uh, to something else. And we've talked about that. And if, if they change the use to something else for, is there a time limit on that? Yeah, I can't remember. I, don't it's quote a me on this. amount of time. Yeah. It, if, if they, like for instance, if if they kind of shut down operations and, um, you know, didn't do anything there or, or the business closed down for, for and, and I want to say it's like a year. Okay. If they did that, then they would lose the legal non-conforming status. But if they shut down temporarily because, you know, I'm just thinking, if, let's passing. say somebody in the family got sick and we know these are family owned businesses right. along mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and they had to shut down for an amount of time. Right. Would they be okay? Uh -huh. As long as as long as they're not shut down for over that time, which I think is like a year. It's it's not a short period of time, okay. um, but uh, and this this applies not just to like businesses. This applies to, to really a, a lot of land use mm -hmm. uh, zoning rights. So for instance, like animal rights. You know, there's some people who have an old pasture that has mm -hmm. horses on it, mm -hmm. and and it's they've had it that way since you know the beginning of the city. Uh, that's something they can continue to do. However, if they move their their horses off for a couple years, they can't bring it's them done. back because they would have lost that legal non-conforming status. Now, you know, I say that because uh, I guess with that example, everybody has animal rights here in Santa Quin City. That's something that's still preserved. But we have a point system where you have to have a, a mm -hmm. certain area in order to have certain animals. So yeah. maybe you've had you know, six horses on a piece of property since the 60s. <laughs> I don't know. You know, you yeah. could continue to do that, but if you take, you know, five of those horses off uh, for, you know, five years, and then you say we want to bring them back, then that wouldn't work because we have uh, the current code would come into play. So that, that would be the, you know, again. So I, you can only continue from that point on with one horse. Well, or whatever our current our current uh, animal okay. rights code says. So I just use it as an example that this applies across the board to uh, various different types of land use rights. It's not just business yeah. and commercial and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Another good example is we have some homes that are on Main Street. Uh, uh, can I pick on you, Kylie? Mm -hmm. So Kylie's business is in an old home. Before she bought it, someone lived in that. Yeah. Um, a, a single family home is not a permitted use anymore on in the Main Street commercial zone. And that's how zoning works is the intent of it is to see, you know, to zone it a certain way and see the, the, the city grow and adapt to where Main Street is, is more um, geared towards commercial type activity. So, you know, this homeowner sold, sold the home to Kylie and Kylie could have lived in that home if she wanted to. Uh, However, she didn't. She turned it into a real estate business, and uh, it's been a real estate business for a year or so now. So it's lost that legal non-conforming status, and that building cannot revert back to a single-family home because it's not a permitted use in that zone. So yeah. does that make sense? Totally. And again, and again mm -hmm. it's not because the city is, is trying to, like, you know, pinch people out of, of what they're doing. They, they can continue to, to ex you know, use the property as they've used it, but... Uh, that's that's how zoning is works is is it's it's meant to kind of guide a particular area uh, into the future for what it, uh, you know what that area uh, maybe maybe most uh, suitable or, or what the vision of that area is. So I think that as far as the minor automotive repair, I think it's kind of silly if we don't have that because if mm -hmm. I mean I don't necessarily think we need a bunch of you know diesel mechanic shops or anything right on Main Street, but I feel like you you said oil change emissions, so like if Fast Tracks wanted to change their car base, mm -hmm. their car wash base into oil spa, I would hate mm -hmm. to see them not be able to do something yeah. like that. And by Fast Tracks, you mean big O? 
You mean rally stop now? Rally stop. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I've been here too long. It's been too many different things. <laughs> oh wait, no, it is fast Big tracks, on. right? <laughs> is it still fast tracks? The mm. Sinclair. Sinclair. Cool. Yeah, it's uh, rally stop. Rally stop. But oh. yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. What it was it fast tracks. It's been yeah. fast tracks. It's been, it's been a few things recently. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Ivanovs used to be mm. ferals. Can mean, you pull up know. the zoning map so we can just see where the uh -huh. CBD, MSC, MSR are all, so we can say, because maybe the minor stays within a certain area from this point forward. Oh, I'm thinking the MSR. And, and I think yeah. the other hard part about MSR, or MSC, I forgot, I'll, yeah. or yeah. I'll have you get up in just a second, um, is that along Main Street on the north side and the south side, mm -hmm. um, they've got residences abutting them. And so then it's kind of hard because we're affecting a lot of people, you know, sure. with commercial businesses. So if you want to get up and, and speak again, you'll have to state your name again for us. So it's Andrea Lee. And I'm not looking for an automotive shop. I, I am in automotive as well, so I kind of <laughs> look out for those guys. But you have 4C Auto. So let's say they wanted to expand their business. Mm -hmm. Are, if they're legal non-conforming, can they make a bigger business? No, so they cannot expand a legal non-conforming use. They can the only footprint of the building. Good to know. They, ca they yeah. can only maintain what what is legal non-conforming. So, um, uh, yeah, that uh, that's that's a a good point where where legal non-conforming things can't be expanded. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but we have a lot of automotive, and I don't know what happened with Tishners or what's going to happen with that. But we already have quite a few automotive businesses on Main Street Commercial. It's been so, kind of part of the Main Street culture mm -hmm. for a long time. <laughs> yeah, and, and right where my residence is, most of, so I've got quite a big lot, and then the lot behind me is all vacant. So not a lot of that's developed. Now I know in some of the MSR zones, there is residential homes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like Jason says, eventually like the house that you own or whatever is now a non-conforming, it can't be a residential again. So I was talking like in the green, just to the north or south oh, yeah. of the MSR. So the ones that are still in a residential zone, but but abutting sure. the MSR. So so yeah, in the instance of that, she's not a legal non-conforming use anymore. She is just a conforming Commercial. use. She's a yeah. permitted use. But it can't go back to a residential. It cannot. Mm -hmm. Nope. Yeah. Because that zone does not allow. And again, zoning is meant to try and try and and mold the city into what you want the future land use to be on that. You know, Main Street, it does have all these, these automotive services, and that's perfectly fine, and they can continue to that. But the way the zoning has been for a while now has been kind of the intent is that it would get away from that and be more of, of a Main Street uh, um, yeah. scale and character. Um, and sometimes those automotive things aren't seen that way. I'm not suggesting that it be one way or the other. I'm just saying that's, that's how zoning works and how it's set up. Now, to a point that was said earlier, you know, MSR... Uh, it's, you know, it is, in zoning, you've heard me say it's kind of like a bullseye and it's meant to kind of transition from more uh, high, in, uh, um, high impact uses in the, in the center and then it's less impactful as you get away from that. And it's not necessarily just the middle of the city out. You can have these intense areas, you know, several times within the city. But that's what the, it was intended with the MSR zone was to be a transition from the higher intensity intensity uses in the MSC and the lower intent the the lesser intense uh, uses in the R8 so the the MSR really um, is is can do what the R8 can it can have a single family home on it uh, but it actually has a lot more um, rights to it because it can can do some commercial it may not be able to do all the commercial that MSC can but it's basically like an R8 zone that's got uh, some commercial that it can do uh, uh, under certain under certain conditions, maybe some multifamily. Uh, that's a change that happened within the last year or two. Uh, so MSR shouldn't be looked at as as it's it doesn't have any rights because it's less than MSC. It's just less than MSC, but more than R8. It's it's part of that whole transitional uh, uh, um, philosophy of of a zoning, you know, of laying out zoning in a city. So are you right where the orange and red meet right, right there? Right there. Yep. So the way that that area is going, would it be horrible if maybe we like rezoned a few sections that seem to be kind of going more that direction anyway, yeah. away from the residential because of where they're located? 
That could certainly be something you, you could recommend. It cannot be recommended now right. because that would be a separate legislative process where we'd, we'd have a specific uh, zoning uh, mm -hmm. amendment. Um, and, you know, there's little things that happen here and there. You can see uh, that it's not clean, straight lines uh, everywhere. Um, you know, the, the, you have little notches and stuff mm -hmm. here. I mean, if you remember, we went through a, a, a zone amendment where I think it was this parcel right here went from a CBD to an MSC because it was... So, yeah, there's little things that you can do there, but... But then uh, the property owners usually bring that forward as a rezone, not mm -hmm. as, you know. Yeah, they'll usually initiate that, but you as a planning commission uh, have that ability to do to initiate any sort of leg legislative action uh, that, that you see, but again... For tonight, it's basically what do we want to allow in these different zones? I, mm -hmm. I would say when you look at zoning and rezoning, think about not what's there today right. think about what you want to be there in the future well and that's what i was thinking because i'm watching how that area of town is changing mm -hmm. and what could potentially be there in the future is that things change and so right. that's where my mind was going and that might that that might be your observation is is we need to expand the c1 <laughs> area that is there around the interchange mm -hmm. or it might be change it to, to msc instead of msr we or want to maintain like this 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 yeah. vision that we've had and, and our zoning reflects that vision of having more of a main street type of commercial with a transition of msr to mm -hmm. to some of the historical lots that are in the r8 zone so that's that's how you need to think through these things is not necessarily what's there today and what do we want and to keep and and whatnot think of zoning as more of what do you want in the future That's all I was kind of just concerned with why we're going over the yeah the land table you know maybe go back through what's already in the land table and see if there's something we can add in the MSR okay so really good observation thank you so much can, can we, we bring that yeah back up? <laughs> like, can we see what's in the MSR I need to see what's what the changes are and what's permitted yeah so but at the same time, keep in mind this is going to affect every parcel in that. Right, just right. Not, not just one area, area the right. whole thing. So you got adult daycare, uh, art galleries, bed and breakfast homes, uh, ancillary commercial, uh, parking lot, <coughs> uh, bachelor dwelling, uh, single family detached dwellings, uh, health care facilities, uh, institutions. <laughs> Uh, That's parks. why the kids are moving nowadays because they can't afford their own house. Mixed use. Uh, public <laughs> public buildings. I don't know. <laughs> oh, did I miss mixed use? Is yeah, so mixed use is a condition. Yeah. I guess I've just mm -hmm. been looking at the permitted. But you could right. have a hotel. Yes, I'm looking at all the non-permitted to see if home. there's any of those we want to change. Yeah, I, I guess I glossed over some of the See, multifamily is conditional, but the conditions that's are... are fine. That's fine. Yeah. That's what I was alluding to that was changed a while ago. Day daycare center. Yeah, so let's, like look say, at, actually, let's look at the non-permitted yeah. so we can see if we need to switch any of those. Switch them back. Oh, okay. And like I say, if we were to pull up the R8 land use table, it's mm -hmm. going to be quite a bit smaller. But, I mean, R8, you're going to, you know, single-family detached homes is what's going to be allowed there. Right. Um, so th there's actually a lot more that's allowed. It's I, I wouldn't look at the MSR as it's limiting in what you can do there. It's... It's a lot more than what you can do just, a, you know, across the street in the R8. But if R8 it says zone. not permitted here, but it is in the R8, that's a confl conflicting... So R8 is not on the screen right now. We're only looking at the Main Street Business District zone, which is CBD, right. MSC, and MSR. So I guess I'm just confused about what you were just saying then. So what I was saying was was the comment was made that, that there's not a lot you can do in the MSR. Mm. You can actually do a lot more in the MSR than you can in the R8 zone. Okay. And they that's are perfect. adjacent to each other. Yeah. So, it's so not permitted. Uh, all the, the alcohol establishments. That's fine. Uh, uh, right now, we've got uh, automotive service and repair, both major and minor, uh, automotive service state station, uh, brew pub, uh, commercial convenience store, uh, heavy commercial, um, retail sales and services. If you remember, that was the one that we looked at where. Yeah, we were thinking where, about that uh, changing. Uh, we, we kept that not permitted, but we created a a new definition for uh, why is that not on? I need to add that on here, but we, we created that new definition for commercial uh, cosmetology. Mm. So that was something that we we allowed and we kind of extracted yeah. from the retail sales and services. 
Okay. Uh, so we kept that not permitted, but but allowed for uh, commercial cosmetology. cosmetology. I can't have a dance hall, drive-in retail. So is a dance hall like footloose, like we're not allowed to dance type thing? Like what is it? (laughs) There's just no dancing allowed period. I know. I'm like, that sounds like something that would be okay. I'm kind of confused. (laughs) And this this is this has been a good exercise because this this is this is kind of a glimpse of what I do for my job. (laughs) You ask what a dance hall is, instead of me saying, Oh yeah, there's a disco ball and music. (laughs) I go straight to the, the definition. The definition, right. <laughs> so a dance hall, per our our definition, is uh, an establishment intended primarily for dancing and entertainment within an enclosed dance floor space, either using live or electronically produced music, either open to the public or operated as a private club open to members only. Ooh. I think private club members only. So it's, it's, a, it's like a, a dance club. Is so the, is there alcohol served? No, because no. Of alcohol. Okay, alcohol. I'm like thinking like a dance club. An alcohol like, establishment mm-hmm. is is not, not allowed. allowed. But I'm thinking like dance hall that <laughs> somebody opens and it's like a like a, there was one up <laughs> in a uh, Logan area where it was they had converted a church into a thing and you would go swing dancing and they'd yeah. have cha cha nights and things like that and it was kind of cool. We can change it. So yeah. I think that's time to do it. Where in the city is that allowed? To, yes. that, like where in the city is the that allowed? Is the would be, I would, it would I would have to look. You have to go yeah. next to Smith's or wherever it's going to be in one day. If, if yeah, you're I've, done, I've done it at the TAC place in Payson. I think that one is not a horrible one to put there. I think that would be yeah, a fine Yeah, I think that should be allowed. Yeah. Especially where alcohol isn't allowed there anyway. We're not going to be worried about Right. Crazy and there's things. noise ordinances like a anyways. private club, yeah. and I'm like, mm. and we, yeah, we have noise ordinances that would control, and control all that all worry that. something. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't, I checked some of the other zones that I thought it could be in there, and I don't see it allowed anywhere else. So. <laughs> I want to get my swing on. Okay. <laughs> me too. Oh, whoops. Let me go back to. Maybe not anymore, but I used to could. So the I Central Business District <laughs> and the Main me Street too. Business District. <laughs> You'd want it allowed there? Yeah. So the dance hall is allowed in the CBD and MSC. It's just not allowed in the MSR. Yeah, so I think if we put it in the MSR, I think it'd be fine. I think that's a nice, it's a fine tradition, I would transitional thing. Mind. I was just going to be. No? I think it should be no, think of MSR as a transition. You've got that, a, a dance club, thinking. and you might have, so go back to the zoning. So yeah, bring up the zoning, though. though. So, so you're going to have a single-family home right here, and mm-hmm. across the street can be a dance a dance hall. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but go to is, where, like, our new... This is your but... but go to where our new office is. You could have a dance hall and a yeah. New so, yeah. Main mm-hmm. Street Business District, you could have one. Just as an example, so. you could have one here, conditionally. You couldn't have one here, and this is... This, these are going to be... Again, that's a transition. So, mm-hmm. maybe someone who, who does buy in the MSR, they, they are buying a lot that is adjacent to and next to... Uh, uh, a, a possible dance hall. Exactly. Or, Where's or the new the, city they, office? Not necessarily a possible really? dance hall, but if you're yeah, you're gonna right. buy a home that's that's just a few lots off of Main Street, I mean you kind of are gonna expect that you're expect probably gonna be stuff. in close proximities to, to some businesses. To businesses. That's just mm-hmm. kind of the nature of cities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The only so other non-conforming thing I was wondering about with the MSR is the seasonal businesses. That sounds like something that. Fireworks stand? What does that mean? Like, what a seasonal yeah. business? Yeah. Selling pumpkins for a few so months. So, seasonal business. Okay, so we took that. So, Is seasonal businesses, let's go back to the code. Oh, it's gone. Okay. Yeah, it's passed out. So, what was the dance hall? It was in addition to the other ones. Okay. Discotheque. <laughs> in the definition. Okay, a seasonal business is not there. Like a fruit stand? <laughs> not there. Okay, so this I think this Christmas seasonal business lot. is one of those. Yeah, so is that going to go under like street exact. vendors yeah, instead? So that's why we took it out, is because we don't have a definition for seasonal businesses. <laughs> well, there we go. What, what that probably falls more under and what we added is temporary uses, which uh, includes okay. seasonal businesses. Can we so read you, that? We go back yeah, to our code. Right we have in the supplementary provisions applicable in all zones right here. And this is actually very applicable to the next agenda item, so this is a good thing to look at. 
uh, you will see these temporary uses. And then within that, um, Ooh, circus. <laughs> you will you will see more of the seasonal type of businesses that that you would Farmer's think of. And you hear seasonal home. businesses. Okay. So and then you know, were those Christmas permitted in all zones or and no? firework stands, snow shacks, ice cream. So this might be your seasonal businesses, but that's that's why we took it out, not because we're against seasonal businesses. We didn't you have just to define. Com- compiled it somewhere else. It's and it's our it's it's more falls under and is already defined in temporary uses. So that works. That's the, again. This this is kind of more of a cleanup than it is. Yeah. We're trying to make any sort of sub- substantial land use. Like I said, I'm looking at the old school version here, not the. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that we should have, um, like I said before, I think the minor automotive. I think that's kind of a no brainer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm hearing too. minor automotive. Uh, mm-hmm. Did you? Anyone else have go any back comment on the on dance that? hall thing? I think a dance hall is already defined. I think we're good there. Oh, dance hall is defined, but you talked yeah, about but if it's it permitted or not. If it's yeah. permitted, I think more so commercial. I think that's probably more c- commercial than actually having it in the middle of a housing. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the reason we took that out in the last meeting was because the model motor repairs usually turn into parking lots or for abandoned disabled mm-hmm. cars. I wonder mm-hmm. if we redefine we automotive. On Main Street. Remember from the last meeting? Because I feel like both of them there. say engine repair too, so maybe we just take engine repair off of the minor. It's not on there. It's not it's on there. Oh, I it's thought it was. It's, it's on major. It's but not it's on major. But transmission repair is basically the same thing. So, and remember yeah. this too about when we talk about land uses, <clears throat> is is it doesn't necessarily come down to whether or not you say it in your code or not. It comes down to enforcement. And so, yes, in an ideal world, we'd have a a whole uh, you know platoon of code enforcement officers that could go address any and all code enforcement issues in the city. I guess in some ways be careful what you wish for because some people would probably really hate having... We did that in West Shore. It's a bad idea. So, no. no. It, again, each city is <laughs> going to decide what, what is important to them. But right now, there are certainly probably some businesses you can point out, and I would not recommend bringing up today because we don't want to single anybody out. But, yeah, there might be an example where you'd be like, no, we don't want to have that. And it may not necessarily be because they do or do not conform to code. It just may be that... We, we, we haven't had the resources to really adequately enforce it. And sometimes enforcement is more complicated than just sending them a letter and say, you can't do this because, th- you know, th- they, they won't want to comply and then it has to go through the court. And so, yeah, just keep that in the back of your mind. When we talk about zoning and land uses, uh, it's always good to have in the back of your mind is, is this enforceable? Is this something that is going to be a, a nightmare to enforce and it's going to, become you know almost a, a need for a, a full-time employee to, to be on top of monitoring letters and 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 coordinating with with you know legal to, to adjudicate it things to think about and then did we change street vendors at all or is it still not conform not allowed? <laughs> uh, street vendors is still hasn't been touched. Permitted in the CBD and the MSC, but not in the right. MSR. And why the two-liter limit on beer sales? <laughs> What's that? Why is there a two-liter limit on beer sales in all of the alcohol establishments? I that's ask you talk. Question I'm probably not the best person to answer. <laughs> uh, I had the same question for for legal counsel, and again, a lot of our our uh, licensing requirements and that refers to state code and that was a recent okay. change that the city council repealed all, all that language and I think our legal preferred that we just defer to state code on, on those types of things that's what I was wondering because if if it's if it's defined by the state do we need to define it we, we could so it's think of it like you know when you, when you get the question or I get the question a lot of, of you know I live in an HOA and they're they're requiring this but the city doesn't require it HOAs can be more restrictive than, uh, than the, city, the city, but they can't be less. It's kind of the same with the state. Yeah, right. we, we can be more restrictive than what state requirements are, but we can't be less. So, so I guess my question is, are we being more restrictive? And is there a reason behind it? And if there's no reason behind it, then we should strike that and just go with what the state has. Just because if and, I wanted yeah. to buy a gallon of root beer... And since the city said I couldn't, I just go buy 
two two liters of root beer. Right? Yeah, and those those were changes that our legal counsel You're a rebel. put forward. I know. And <laughs> I was really looking for 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 because he he's more knowledgeable about about. So those I just things. I don't understand the I, I just don't have any logic that I can think of behind that. So that's why I'm asking. Not that I drink or. So I just it's it's weird to me. It just doesn't fit for some reason. And and to be clear. There's no proposed change there. It's just instead of uh, he he's written in a way that's just more clear. Yeah. Two liters instead of uh, parentheses two L. So he he just made it so it's clear. Why it's that way, I I don't know. If it's really okay. something you want to change, then you know it could be something more. But I, I think let me let me say this too. I mean, if it's arbitrary, let's just pick a gallon and a half. You know. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? It's just, it, it just three seems liters, odd. So yeah, yeah three liters. liters. Or, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> well, and, and like I say, I don't know the reason behind it. I'm I'm pretty sure that there probably was a reason when, when that language was created. Uh, that sometimes takes a lot of digging, and you may not never be able to dig far enough to know exactly why yeah. code was written to, to restrict two liters. Uh, but this is maybe a good opportunity to say this as well. You guys are bringing up very good questions, and, and this is the type of thought process that we're going through with, with looking at all these land use tables. We're not going to be able to, to, to um, be able to address every little detail. I think there's a lot of things we've been able to clean up, and, and uh, this will really help make this zone a lot more clear and less ambiguous. But uh, yeah, if there's things that are kind of low-hanging fruit that you say, yeah, we would prefer to see you know, minor automotive service repair permitted in this zone, then great. But yeah. some of these other things are probably a little bit more, more uh, uh, need more attention and more in-depth understanding to really give you a, a good a, a good answer. So, uh, I think for purpose, sometimes, you know, this this proposed amendment I think will be a really good step in the right direction to clean up that code. But uh, is, is it a really high priority for the city right now to, to figure out whether you can have two liters or three liters? I don't know, but... I, I don't want it to be a high priority. I just want us to think through it and make sure that we're not right causing problems from, I don't know, And again, it's, it's consistent with, with the way the code's always been, and we haven't had necessarily issues with that, so... Um, Well, and I think, I mean, I don't want this to be a perpetual project for us, but ultimately we could table it and we could reevaluate. If there was something that was a really high priority you wanted to readdress and bring up, then yeah, you can you can always reinitiate it. Or we can make a, a motion and ordinance. Uh, get on I'd, with it. I'd make a motion that the minor be added. Mm -hmm. to all In the three, MSC? To all. MSC, MSR? Yeah. Yeah. Not, not the residential, but the other but two. But the other two, yeah. So CBD is literally like two blocks. And yeah, I don't yeah, know if you're gonna that's like center street. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're I wouldn't do I don't think you're gonna mm -hmm. want a mechanic shop there for sure. Every time you say C B D I think two blocks is enough for that. But <laughs> it's, it's, I'm thinking something else besides <laughs> Central Business District. Yes, yeah, yeah, Central Business Central District. Central Business District. <laughs> Pardon me. But I don't know if you want a mechanic yeah. shop within that two block, mm -hmm. you know. I think maybe like the maybe the MSC. Maybe MSC. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I could, fine. I could see the MSR a little bit as well, because she brought up that point. If Forcey wanted to expand, he can only expand into the MSR. Mm -hmm. But if he came yeah. to us, we could always we could maybe address oh, maybe like yeah. rezoning to C1 or something. So yeah, he right. Could. And I even thought maybe that first block of MSC, it's rezoned to C1. But at some yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking is that area needs. Mm -hmm. to I guess the only concern I have is what. Yeah. Commissioner Hoffman brought up was the transmission repair in the minor. Maybe that that just needs to be struck. Mm, that's basically yeah. the same as an engine. Yeah. Because if that's going to just basically have stagnant cars sitting around collecting mm -hmm. them, maybe yeah. that's not ideal. Yeah, we don't want that. That's but if a, we're looking at just like your general point. jiffy lube changing out. Quick in and out hour deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fix the radiator real quick. So I, just to be clear, what I'm hearing is uh, automotive, automotive repair service minor. repair minor. You want to remove overhaul or transmission work? Yes. Okay. Do we I take mean, out? You can, you can change transmission fluid, but we don't want them. So maybe just it overhaul the same... of transmission. That's lubrication and all that. Yeah. Does that have lubrication yeah. out there? Oh yeah, so that's fine. Tune-ups. What about trailers? 
What about? Trailer? Do you want to keep incorporating and trailer minor. repair? Hmm. And something minor? Mm. Maintenance, yeah. repair and maintenance. That would be like tires and stuff. Yeah, and, like, and, al and alignment and two. that type of thing, wouldn't it? That's what I would think. So if trailers is on there, if they get new tires, they could go there. But if they're needing some major work done, they got to go to space. They'd have to go to the major. Body work, reweld an axle, mm -hmm. et cetera. I'm, I'm assuming that for automotive repair minor in the MSC, you want to mm -hmm. have it conditional? Sure. Again, that might be a project down the road. Mm -hmm. That again, we need to define those what those conditions, uses. specific conditions are. But mm -hmm. I think that insinuates that it's probably a little bit more on the impactful side, where there might be some additional conditions you want to attach to it. Perfect. So I. Sorry, I'm just not jotting down notes so I know exactly what it is that you guys wanted me to address. So I've got uh, remove overhaul or transmission work from the minor auto definition. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some, some little mistakes I need to make in the alcohol definitions. Uh, that I noticed there I need, to, I need to add commercial cosmetology because that was a, kind to of the a, table. <laughs> an amendment that we made right in the middle of doing all this. Uh, I think it was on and the then table. I've got a uh, conditional for minor auto in Main Street commercial. Anything else that you guys talked about? I think that's a step in the right direction. Okay, if that's it. So those are pretty minor changes. We could make a motion to forward it with, with the those. condition that these changes be made yep yeah, i think so some of those are mm -hmm. just just little fixes but uh i don't think anything of too much substance well i'm going to make a motion to forward this uh, to the city yeah. council and with the changes that we're going to make i don't even know how to talk tonight it's You're fine. positive with recommendation, positive recommendation. The there we go with the changes with proposed. the changes proposed, proposed. I'll get there. And just to be clear, those changes are including remove overhaul or transmission work from the minor auto definition. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll fix the errors and then conditional for minor auto in the Main Street commercial. Yeah. Okay. In addition of the commercial yep. cosmetology. Yeah, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll fix those. Yep. Those are kind of more Scribner commercial errors. Cosmetology. And Scribner errors. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? I will second. Thank you. Commissioner, wait. Okay, let's go ahead and vote then. Commissioner Hoffman. Aye. Commissioner Romero. Aye. Commissioner Waite. Aye. Commissioner McNuff. Aye. Commissioner Nixon. Aye. Commissioner Lance. Aye. Motion carries. All right, moving right along, we'll get on to agenda item number five, which is the public hearing for the agricultural related amendments. We have a public hearing on this one, but I'll let Jason read us in. Yeah, and really the, the, the purpose of this public hearing was, was specific to uh, definition for agritourism. We'll, we'll get to that in, in a little bit. So <laughs> let, let me take you through kind of the thought process I thought about this because we had a really good extensive discussion at the last planning commission meeting on this topic about really kind of a broad uh, approach and a change to, to agriculture in Santa Quin City uh, and, and possibly a allowing for some things to, to make agriculture a little bit more financially viable and therefore uh, helps them to, to continue farming and, and preserving agriculture. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and it's I think it's proving to be a little bit more complicated with, with some of the things we talked about in the last meeting and I think it's something that can still be worked on. But for the time being, based on the, the requests that originally came forward, and as I've kind of looked through and reviewed some code as well, I, I found something that I think could probably be a little bit easier uh, change to make and, and be a little bit more of a smaller baby step uh, in this direction. So what I'm getting at, and, and to kind of take you through what, what, what I looked at, is part of, part of the, the 
um, thought process that came from the initial request was was there's a particular farm that wants to have s certain types of activities. Mm -hmm. um, the initial thought that I had was well, um, some of those activities could be fall under the classification of a temporary use uh, or you know seasonal uses mm -hmm. we don't have defined, but as as one might think think of um, that maybe it could work that way. However. My thought was, oh, well, temporary uses can't happen in a in a residential zone um, because you know when I think of temporary uses, I think of like fireworks stands, snow shacks, things like that. Um, now I'll get there in a bit. Uh, maybe don't be too alarmed. But as <laughs> I looked at the the R10 zone, I noticed that uh, temporary uses subject to the provisions of of that code is a permitted use in a residential zone, and that kind of surprised me and it got me thinking a little bit. So. Now, if I go down to uh, temporary uses, which is, again, uh, 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 understood as a permitted use in that zone, you can see that circus or carnival and related accessory uses is a temporary use. However, it says permitted on public or quasi-public properties or private properties having more over five acres. Okay. That one's an interesting one <laughs> where if someone had five acres in a residential zone, mm -hmm. I don't know how I'd say no to that. <laughs> I'm not worried that we're going to have a carnival that wants to show up on a five-acre five acre parcel <laughs> in a residential zone. But you can <laughs> see this is kind of my thought process as I looked at it. Other things get a little bit more specific. You know, model home or dwelling unit is permitted in all zones. Uh, produce stands must be located on a property adjacent to an arterial or collector street, and then it gives specific areas. So it's not just carte blanche. Temporary uses are permitted, and you can do all sorts of things. Okay. With each category of a temporary use, there's there's a little bit more uh, of a condition for where it can be located. I think while we're in here, we probably could could clean up some of these. Uh, probably the most um, recognized temporary use would be you know your Christmas tree lots, fireworks stands, snow shacks, things like that. Allowed if the use is permitted in the zone. An accessory to the principal use or if no principal use exists would be permitted as a standalone use on the site. So what that means is a snow shack just can't show up on someone's lot because it needs to be uh, um, accessory to uh, a commercial use. Now I think that actually can be worded a little bit better but I think that's the intent of the code is you just can't pop up a, a snow shack on a vacant residential lot it's got to be accessory to another business. And so that's why those don't work in a residential zone. But you can see as my thought process as I look at this that it's like, oh, you know, uh, this is another section of code that we could probably spend some time on cleaning up and making sure that it's clear and meeting the, the expectations of the city. So the idea, going back to agriculture, not to dive down a rabbit hole with that, but you can kind of see some of the things that I'm starting to kind of think about and discover as, I, as I'm, you know, preparing for this. The thought that I had was, was again, to address the, the initial idea that came forward was maybe we make agritourism its own row and have it as a temporary use, and then we, we can have location standards. Maybe it needs to be on five acres or whatever it, it, it may be. Duration, we can make it specific to just, you know, no more than three or four months or whatever. You know, if, if we're, we're fine having it up over, over the summer. Um, and that's typically when I think a lot more agritourism would happen is in order to have agritourism, mm -hmm. you need, you know, the agriculture to be in season. Uh, there's probably not going to be much agritourism going on in the wintertime. There maybe could be, but that's probably a discussion for another day and as we do more of a deep dive, comprehensive look at it. So... Uh, without getting too long-winded, I'm starting to see some glazed eyes as we, we talk about all this. Um, for tonight's purposes, and the public hearing was set for, was a definition for agritourism. That would be a, a good start. Mm -hmm. Next meeting, I would need to set a public hearing so that we can dive more into and, and, a, and, and propose changes and make changes to this temporary uses section of code. And again, my proposal would be something along the lines of creating an agritourism row uh, with with specific location standards and duration and, and things like that. While we're in there, I think there probably could be a little bit of cleanup so that uh, some of those other temporary uses are defined. So, with all that said, um, so we just want 
a definition. So I put together a draft definition for agritourism. I'd like your feedback on that. This is There's no recommendation being made on this tonight. I mean, I guess you could if you really wanted to, but I think it probably is going to make sense for it to move in conjunction with, with the, the section uh, um, of code regarding temporary uses. So I put this together. I'd like your feedback. Again, you could even say, that sounds great. Let me sleep on it for two weeks, and we can talk about it more. So let me just tell you what, what, what I've got drafted so far. So I've had agritourism defined as the practice of touring agricultural areas to view and enjoy agricultural related activities for recreational entertainment or educational purposes. Activities for visitors to enjoy in a commercial or non-commercial way should be secondary to and supportive of the agricultural, agricultural use of the property without taking away from the distinct farming purpose and character of the area. Such activities may include receptions, photography, markets, UPIC, festivals, and farming demonstrations. What do you think of that definition? Pretty dang good. I like it. I yeah. would mm -hmm. probably replace enjoy with participate in. Mm -hmm. mm. And I, I, I think as I read that, I probably would change that word should to must. There you go. Yeah, that's Shall. good. It's really good. Shall. Compared yeah. to where we started. So this might be a good time as you're thinking about it to open in uh, your public hearing, do your public hearing. Okay. So this is a public hearing on the agricultural related amendments and the definition of agritourism opening at 8.30. The public hearing, does anyone want to address the commission? Okay, we'll close that at 8.30 again. Is there any discussion? So is that the only change that was made to this? Well, we looked at another change well, to this as well. Again, we were having more of a comprehensive I would probably put this particular ordinance on the shelf when we can get, you know, have more time. Um, uh, when we get uh, some uh, some more help in the community development department, uh, quite frankly. Um, so you're not moving forward with this and all? No. Themselves. So this, again. So the only thing you're worried about is the, the definition. I, I would like your thoughts and direction on that. Again, you don't have to give that to me tonight, but I wanted to get this before you. Uh, what I would probably bring forward. Uh, to you next time would be a new draft ordinance uh, that would include this this agritourism definition and then it would include uh, proposed amendments uh, to the temporary use section that way we could address this this topic in a little bit more of a smaller step instead of redefining the rather than going uses. through this big comprehensive change with agriculture in the entire city so it's still a worthy topic. It's still mm -hmm. something that we probably yeah. uh, would like to, to dive into. But I, like I say, it's proving to be a little bit more complicated. And based on kind of the situation we're in right now, uh, unfortunately, I just don't have the time to put to it to be able to really uh, vet out a lot of those great points that were made at the last meeting. So I think this is a little bit more of an easy way to address some of the, the, the thoughts and ideas that are out there. And, you know, talking with legal counsel, he even suggested maybe this ordinance could even have like a, a, a sunset on it where we could try this out for a year or two. We could, we could see what agritourism as a temporary use looks like, if, if it works, if, it, if, it's, if it's what the, the city would like to see. And then, you know, at the end of a year or two or whatever sunset we put on that particular ordinance, we could reevaluate and say, yeah, this is working great. We want to keep it and, and make it a permanent part of our code. Or we could say, yeah, it, it's just not quite working out for us. So um, uh, there's, there's a number of different things we can do. But again, for tonight's purposes, it was mostly to introduce to you the idea of maybe modifying the temporary use of section and having you look at the agritourism definition. And if you're good with all that or, or you have any thoughts or direction, give it to me. If not, um, you know, this will be something that you'll, you'll see in two weeks. And you can give me your, your thoughts and feedback uh, 
via email as well if you'd like. Uh, I know this is kind of just your initial uh, look at this definition and, and, and hearing this, this uh, kind of different angle that I've, I've, I've uh, introduced to you. So the USDA has a definition for agatorism. And we, we you just wanted lot. to change it more for us. So I looked at a lot of different definitions yeah. and took a lot of pieces from different things and really tried to tailor it to, to what what I think we want it to, to, to be here in Santa Quin. You know, the, 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 particularly the area in the middle about uh, commercial, non-commercial, shall be secondary to in support of agriculture. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was something that I put an emphasis on myself because I think if this is going to work uh, – we, we need to, ha to have a good line drawn of, of what is an appropriate commercial activity that is supportive of agriculture versus a commercial activity that might be, you know, crossing that line and being more impactful and not necessarily what we think is, is in harmony with agriculture. Again, the whole purpose of this is not necessarily to introduce this new uh, amazing business opportunity per se. It's to to Supplement. help make agriculture more fi financially viable so that it can continue to, to uh, happen and, and so that it can be preserved in the community. That's, that's kind of the whole intent behind this, this, uh, this proposal. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it, maybe it's okay if it, if it is this grand new opportunity, but again, with this definition, it's meant to be secondary to and not take away from the distinct farming purpose and character of the area. Again, that's the, the kind of intention behind this whole thing is preserve agriculture. Right. Yeah. This definition on here even says it's a way of bringing in visitors onto farms and ranch and stuff. You know, it's just a, it's not to take over. It's to be there. So I like it. I like that definition. Yeah, yeah I do too. Yep. Okay. If there's no more discussion, then I will look for a motion. Actually, yes. Do we need to? We have education on there. Okay, motion to okay. table would be great. Yeah. Okay. I'll make a motion to table this um, to create a more descriptive temporary use description for agritourism. Very good. I will second that. Commissioner Romero seconds. And I will do a roll call vote. Commissioner Hoffman. Aye. Commissioner Romero. Aye. Commissioner Waite. Aye. Commissioner McNuff. Aye. Commissioner Nixon. Aye. Commissioner Lance. Aye. Motion carries. Moving right along here, item uh, agenda item number six, detached accessory dwelling units. This will be an exploratory, exploratory discussion. Yeah. So this yes. is, we didn't have a public hearing or, or anything accompanied with us. The reason for that is because this is something that the council directed uh, me to, to bring to the planning commission and have you start to discuss. Uh, I realize that some of you are new enough that weren't a part of when when detached accessory dwelling units were defined and allowed in the R8 zone. Um, so I, I can take a step back if you'd like so I can explain a little bit more what a detached accessory dwelling uni unit is and what uh, opportunities and, and challenges it could present. But um, to, to maybe expound a little bit more on why the council wanted this to move forward is they, they uh, had, had some requests within the, the community for, for this particular po topic to be looked at a little bit closer. Um, the council, uh, we talked about this in a work, work session meeting with the council, and they are very uh, open to the idea of maybe expanding um, this use within the city. So right now, Detached accessory dwelling units are only allowed in the R8 zone, but the council is, would like the planning commission to look a little further into maybe allowing it in other residential zones, um, maybe all residential zones. Um, I think an initial uh, thought that they had, and, and maybe kind of a starting point, would be to look at our, our detached accessory dwelling unit uh, language and maybe see how that fits in other zones. Um, no, we have, and I can I can go there right now. So if you want to look at it yourself, it is in that supplementary provisions applicable in all zones, mm -hmm. and uh, about halfway down you'll see accessory dwelling units, and then it's broken down to attached, which is, you know, your basement apartment and and things that are within the, the main dwelling, 
and then down below we have detached. So these 10, 11 uh, criteria are really the standards for, for what it takes to have a um, uh, detached accessory dwelling unit in the R8 zone. Um, we have location standards, size and setbacks, and I think when this was approved, it was felt like location and size and setbacks would kind of determine whether or not a particular parcel could have it. Um, there was a thought that, that, oh, we allowed it in the R8 zone, why wouldn't we allow it in the R10 zone? Those are bigger lots. Well, not necessarily. Uh, if you look at the, in fact, mm -hmm. I, I should have been prepared with this. I could find it if you'd like, but um, uh, I had uh, Ethan, who's our GIS technician, put together a map of the R8 zone, and a majority of the lots are probably a third of an thing. acre or more. Mm -hmm. There's a, a good chunk of them that are, are half an acre. Mm -hmm. And again, it's because it's the, the traditional uh, historical core of the city and you know those lots were a lot bigger uh, when they were were you know originally established because you know there was probably a farming agrarian element to them so the R8 zones not necessarily smaller it's still the majority of the parcels in the R8 zone are actually quite large so I think there was never really a concern that way um, so the R10 don't insinuate that the R10 zone is going to be a lot bigger lots just because mm -hmm. the minimum uh, uh, requirement is, is 10,000 square feet. But with that said, maybe an angle you could take is, is and something that's not talked about in, in this language is having like a, a minimum lot area. Um, so may, maybe regardless of what zone, um, um, what residential zone a detached accessory dwelling would be allowed you would need to have a minimum lot area of X like number of square feet. or whatever. So um, that would be one angle you could take. So Does I it, guess that's probably uh, kind of the introduction. Again, this is not this is this is not my proposal. This is this is a um, this is something that the council felt was was uh, a good topic for the, the the planning commission to explore more and decide if 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 this is something that should be allowed in more residential zones. Does it define the parking? Uh huh. So parking mm -hmm. is just down there. Uh, any property containing a detached ADU shall provide two off-street parking spaces for residents of the unit. Tandem parking shall not qualify as approved parking. Tandem is front to back. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Do you mind pulling that map up that you said you got that yeah. showed how many? Give me a second. I, I okay. should have been prepared Sorry. with that, but I'll, I'll need to find. I that. did a version of that last yeah. summer, and it's it's awesome. I, I love it. it. Because it's kind of cool how everything's spread out and you see how big the properties really are. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like if they can have a horse on a third of an acre, why can't they have an ADU? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think, I think Especially size with the housing the these days. Should dictate. Yeah. And they've got the setbacks and everything already written in here. So mm -hmm. well, that was quicker than I thought. This is just a quick email search for <laughs> Ethan. So uh, the red area are the parcels mm -hmm. within the R8 zone that... Uh, are are less than ten thousand square feet, or in the case you'll see this this big red parcel. That's mm -hmm. that's got a development agreement uh, uh, that's been approved to have some multifamily units on that. So that's why it's shown as red. That's MSR anyway, isn't it? It's 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 C one. It was MSR. rezoned. Yep, you're right. That is that was rezoned. So that probably doesn't even apply on here. Good yeah. good MSR. catch. <laughs> mm -hmm. That that was rezoned to an MSR zone. So uh, you can just disregard that, I guess. The yellow parcels are ones that are between 10,000 square feet and 20,000 square feet. 10,000 square feet is roughly a quarter of an acre. 20,000 square feet is roughly half an acre. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you can see the green is everything that is is a half an acre or above. So as you kind of look at it, the majority of what you see there is is green and yellow. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's all larger than, than a quarter of an acre. And that's all the R8? Yeah, minus the the MSR area yeah. that Drew okay. pointed out. So this is the only zone, this is the only area where detached uh, accessory dwelling units are allowed. So the question is, is should they be allowed elsewhere? If so, what regulation would you attach? Would you just keep the way things are based on the location requirements and setbacks that we have? Or would you want to even look uh, a little further and, and, and have other regulations on top of that as, as you see fit? Have you had any applications for So we this? have yet, yet to have an official application. We've had uh, 
many inquiries, um, <clears throat> frankly, probably half the inquiries are probably from people who are in the R10 zone, and we just have to inform them that it's not allowed in that zone. Uh, the other half are, are, are in the R8, and they're more kind of, yeah. you know, just exploratory, interested mm -hmm. in, in what they are and what they can do. Do they tell uh, you what the holdup is, why they don't? Why they don't go no, not necessarily. Uh, I, I do. I think there's a pretty sh uh, strong indication from one person that he wants to move forward and do one. But again, an application hasn't been submitted yet. But I, I think this particular individual is motivated to, to do one. On, I think on, construction's on been pretty tough this mm -hmm. past year. So I think maybe it would loosen up the coming well, year, maybe. And, and it, it, but if you don't have to buy the property, that helps a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's still hard to get people there. Yeah. Just get materials. So I have talked a lot tonight. Feel free to, to say, okay, <laughs> you can stop talking and, and we, can, we can move forward. Um, but uh, there was a couple things that uh, I have done in the past that uh, is related to this. And let's see. Another one. Well, not quite, but... So th this this is actually a, a project that I did, and, and I'll, I'll look for something else that I'll bring up to you because I think Kylie brings up a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, for those that aren't aware of what uh, an accessory dwelling unit is, or particularly a detached, uh, they are they are the, usually these backyard cottages or casitas, or or you know sometimes people can call them mother-in-law apartments. Mm -hmm. The intent of them is is to be small. They're not intended to be like a second home on the parcel, although they are detached and, and you know, I guess they would be someone's home, but they're meant, meant to be smaller and more like uh, accessory to, to the main home. Um, now, our, our current regulations that we put together um, uh, restrict these to be uh, any bigger than an 800 square foot uh, oh. footprint. Uh, now, they can be a total of 1,600 square feet so if they have like a mm -hmm. second story yeah. or a basement. Mm -hmm. um, and they could, they could be above like a detached garage and the garage area is part of that. A good question was brought up of, of would like a carport or a, a, a covered porch be part of that? Probably not, um, but that's, that could be something that as we're in here, we could clarify a little bit more so that uh, people looking at these have a, a clear understanding of what is part of that square footage or not. The reason I say that is because usually the footprint is defined by what is the foundation. A covered porch, like is even in this picture there, you know, th there, there's going to be little footings for that, but it's, it's you know, it's mostly going to be flat work with, with a, um, you know, a, a covering or an awning or above the top. And that would be the case with, with the parking mm -hmm. spaces. We, we require two parking spaces anyways. If they wanted to, to cover it up so that it's, you know, uh, repels frost and, and whatnot a little bit better and provides some shade, then then that, that may be something that would be good. But that, that could be something that as we're in here, we can clarify that a little bit more. So, um, yeah, this, this, this was actually a, a, a project that I worked on uh, uh, um, for my, my graduate degree. Um, one thing that I see that these units can provide is, is is truly an affordable option. The reason why I think it's truly affordable, uh, and, and again, I've, I've kind of indicated that I think there's there's a, a different kind of housing gap. When you hear the term housing gap, it's usually a, a, um, a difference between supply and demand. But for in this market that we're in right now, there is a high, high, high demand, and uh, there's certainly a, 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 a huge housing gap there because we have more people than, than we have homes. But I, I think specifically of, of the demographic that is between the ages of 18 and 30. Now, ADUs don't necessarily just apply to that age group. Uh, it's, it's a great option for, for, I think, the 65 plus as well. But when I talk about affordability, which is a, a huge hot topic in the state right now, I, Frankly, I just I, I'm very empathetic towards anybody who's in that demographic. I don't know how they're supposed to find a place to live, uh, or a place to settle down, a place to buy on their own, um, and and so frankly, we're probably getting a lot more of these accessory dwelling units, whether they're they're actually go through a, a you know a permitting <laughs> process or not, because you know kids are living in their parents' basement yeah. or they just they cannot find an affordable option mm -hmm. based on on their their you know 
status as a 25 year old. So that's that's one thing to, to think about with this. But part of the reason why they're they're uh, in my opinion, more affordable is not just based on on the fact that they're really small, um, is because they're they're built on existing improved lots. Uh, as you can see, I found some data that, that indicated mm -hmm. that uh, you know this says 21.5 percent, but you could think between 20 and 25 percent of of the cost to develop a lot, uh, and I should say improve a new lot, uh, would be saved if. If uh, they're able to build on an already existingly uh, an existing improved lot, so if you build a new, you know, like like we had earlier on the agenda, those lots uh, are going to cost some money in order to build all the the utilities, the the um, mm -hmm. the infrastructure, the the uh, you know the individual services. The um, <laughs> sorry, I'm drawing a blank. The the, the individual sewer and water that runs at the house, uh, those costs are associated with development, and, and they're going to be associated with that the ultimate price of that lot. These units, however, you're going to save that twenty, roughly twenty percent, because you're not going to have to create a new street with it with laterals. Mm -hmm. That was the word yeah. I, was, I was not thinking of. With to have new laterals and things like that. Now there's probably going to be some work. Uh, that, that needs to be done and and so it's that's maybe not like a true savings but nonetheless that's why I think these detached ADUs are, are a really appealing option now we already allow for attached ADUs but I think detached uh, are gonna be a lot more uh, they're gonna be separated they're gonna be private they're gonna be more appealing than having someone live in your basement uh, and depending on on how they're implemented and landscape they could very much feel like like their own little separate mm -hmm separate area now we do not allow for ADUs to be subdivided and sold off differently right. they have to be on the same lot as as a owner occupied single family oh. dwelling mm -hmm. um, they have to be owner occupied either the <laughs> main or the ADU, right correct yep and so you know a lot of <laughs> articles the out there about right these <laughs> some people will build them and they'll like it so much that they'll move mm -hmm. into it and then they'll rent out their house um, and that might be more for for this demographic that mm -hmm. has a larger family more kids but when you think about it this demographic that's either single you know maybe newly married or even with with a, a, a young kid or the demographic that is our empty nesters that and, and even in between you may have have you know a single mother or mm -hmm. someone who is single and travels a lot and they don't necessarily want or need a, a very large home there's a, a lot of of people that this this could be a uh, an, an attractive uh, housing option for. Um, so I think the thing that I like most about these is, is there's just a lot of flexibility. Uh, and really it puts a lot of the, the, the power, um, and I say power, but it look, puts a lot of the, the control in our, our, our residents' hands. Instead of having, you know, and, and that's partly what happened with, with this being applied to the R8 zone, is at that same time, Multi-family was 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 excluded or, or wasn't permitted in the R8 zone anymore. This kind of acted as kind of a replacement for for some of that multi-family that was not allowed anymore. So, um, uh, uh, with that said, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So tonight we're just basically discussing, and if it's favorable, you'll take that back mm -hmm. to the city council. Well, it's it's basically yeah. Uh, talk about it, kind of explore the options, and then and then I'll take your direction. If if you 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 like the idea and you want to move forward, uh, we can start to put together a draft ordinance. If you don't like the idea at all and you say this is a terrible idea, we don't want to do it, then then you could give give that direction, and or, or we could put it on the agenda next time, and you could give kind of your official recommendation and, and pr provide some findings of why you feel it's that way. Either way, I would take it back to the city council. So. Um, yeah, the thought that I was saying before was was uh, these detached accessory dwelling units uh, really provide the opportunity and the flexibility for our existing residents. Mm -hmm. Instead of having the multifamily next door, which which you know has, has been really a lot of pushback on, and having you know someone build uh, two or three units next door and then leave and then it turns into a rental, that's something that's kind of out of out of their control. Yeah. However, if they built something like this. It provides that that more affordable renting option mm -hmm. 
but it's in their own backyard. They're, they're the ones who are, are, are putting it behind them. They have the, the, the ability to decide what it looks like and, and how it's managed and how, you know, what, what the renters are that go in there. Now, um, that, that's, that's just another angle that you can look at with these. Uh, I don't have it prepared tonight. I can provide it to you next mm -hmm. time. But I think another great thing, and, and I point to Kylie because she actually helped me a little bit with this, is through this process, I, I felt like this, this is a great option, but I think the problem with it is people just don't know what it is. And so uh, part of this project that I did was, was uh, I, I got a, a local uh, builder, uh, a local a loan officer and then a, a local real estate agent to help me understand what it would be like to implement this. What I found, and again, this this information is is now a, a year and a half or so uh, old. It would need to be updated, but I kind of use broad ranges anyways. To build something like this, uh, it was determined a year and a half ago that you would probably be able to build something like this for between one hundred twenty-five, one hundred fifty thousand dollars. That sounds like a lot of money for a little something like this, but that's certainly but if a lot. you've been around forever, you've got equity in your home nowadays yeah. that you can mm -hmm. easily do that and have your... It's certainly a lot more even. cheaper than some of the, the new uh, uh, homes that, mm -hmm. that you could build. And again, this is this is not including any sort of the, any sort of the um, uh, actual lot improvement costs. Right. So if you could build one for between $125,000, $150,000. In looking at the, the loan options, that was something I worked with a, a, a local loan officer, and they didn't really have a great uh, option for for doing this because um, you need to have enough equity to, to mm -hmm. built up in order for you to qualify for certain loans. Yeah. However, after this this exercise, I think they've kind of you know looked at this and said said this might be something that uh, could be something of the future that we we could accommodate, and so. Um, Regardless of that, if you were to be able to qualify for a loan, your anticipated, uh, and I, I think I did it, I think it was a 15-year loan, and, mm -hmm. and it, was, it was, I can't remember the interest rate, but a 15-year loan, you could, your, your loan payment would be somewhere between, I think it was $1,000 and $1,300. Working with Kylie, uh, working with a local real estate agent, mm -hmm. she looked at it. Uh, at this this hypothetical she she said you know it was roughly a studio there might be one bedroom bathroom mm -hmm. things like that and and uh, she determined that that you could possibly rent it for between one thousand and three hundred dollars or one thousand and thirteen hundred dollars so really if this is something that you can can make that initial investment and 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 go through the work of building what you could lease it for could pretty much offset what the loan payment is. So really, it after 15 years, this just becomes an asset for mm -hmm. a property owner to have in their backyard. And whether they want to rent it out and have supplementary income, you know, it's up to them. Or if they want to have it there for for an aging parent uh, that that wants a little bit more of their own private space, they could do that. Or if they want to have it for kid their kids that are are just looking to get their feet underneath them, that that's kind of what we're looking at. And so. I think a lot of this is really kind of an educational process. That's partly why, you know, we, we've allowed this in the R8 zone and the floodgates didn't open and everybody and their dog came and wanted to start building one in their backyard. I think part of it's because people don't quite know what this is and what it means and what it would take to do it. And that could be part of the educational process. So that's a little bit more context. Mm -hmm. uh, like I say, I could go <laughs> on and on, uh, but I don't want to. I wanted to, to really just introduce this to you get some of your initial feedback and then again based on on what your feedback is i can either have something prepared with a public hearing next meeting and and maybe a proposal based on your 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 direction and feedback or if you just don't like the idea at all of expanding it elsewhere then i think you can give me that feedback as well and we'll prepare prepare accordingly i have a quick question like a lot of the uh developments here there's a lot of hoas mm -hmm. they're more restrictive mm -hmm. than the zoning Mm -hmm. The community. So you have to like stick I, with that. I live in an HOA. I have to try to get one of those. I, 
they chip me down. They wouldn't allow it, you know. Only if it's that, not. Only if it's defined that you can't have it. Yeah, and it it's in the CCRs that it, it wouldn't be allowed. So. And unfortunately, that that would be something that an HOA could could monitor. Now, uh, I believe right thing. now mm -hmm. they could not do that for attached, and I think that's something that the state has said. Uh, uh, cities or HOAs can't restrict. I think I think that's the yeah. new recent le state legislation that, again, in their attempt to try and provide more affordable housing, that's something that that I don't think you can just prohibit anymore. Uh, we we certainly have regulations to to make it safe and appropriate and and not too impactful. Um, this is going down a rabbit hole. Maybe a discussion for another day. Right now, we don't really have a permitting process for internal accessory dwelling units, that might be something we want to do so that we have a little bit better idea of what's out there and that people are going through the appropriate process and making sure that they're they're safe and, yeah. and up to building code and that sort of a thing. But that's something that, that since those were initially allowed, hasn't been done. But these ones would be a little bit different because they wouldn't be able to happen unless there was an, a, a building permit, um, at least new ones. Yeah. And I don't think there's too many detached garages out there that would just kind of work there's there's obviously going to be some but um um uh, yeah all those but you bring up a good point i think <laughs> detached still is not necessarily something the state has has said you cannot prohibit and so ccnrs would still come into play and could restrict it in some areas but that's that's for an hoa to, mm -hmm. to figure yeah. out obviously what we, what we have uh the ability to control what the city has the ability to 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 govern is is our code yes I personally think that if the people have enough land to put that much square footage in with all the guidelines in place and stuff, I don't see a reason that it shouldn't expand to the entire city. Yeah, let's read the ADU description again and see what those setbacks are. I think something that could be super great but also somewhat impactful would be that a property owner rented these as like an Airbnb or VRBO. I think that's something mm -hmm. we should always type take into consideration that it yeah. might just yeah. not be a family member but ultimately the the homeowner should be living there regulating yeah. they'll it, be there right on the, the property at least right, right? exactly yeah, so, so they, they have to let the young people great, that they let you into know, their backyard you know an, an older person like jason said mm -hmm. how is that is that enforceable? I know. So, I mean, sound ordinance and stuff, I mean, obviously would be enforced, but I'm thinking like an older person that is living on a fixed income, that would be really cool if they could build something like this and make an extra five or six hundred bucks a month. Mm -hmm. um, based on the information you gave me, they could be making over a Well, and those numbers are month. way old. <laughs> so, I mean, rents now are totally different like than when we spoke though. a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and if you're talking a VRBO or something like that, they're mm -hmm. going to make even more than rent. Right. They'll make three times what a long-term yeah. rental yeah. would yeah. take. I want to focus on the setbacks just to make sure what size of property would this fit on? Like, yeah. what's the ideal size property? Because yeah, maybe so instead of saying R8, we say you have to be on this property and right. your PUD, HOA, mm -hmm. CCRs all have to be within, like, and within allowing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know what? And, and to Drew's point... Uh, that map was correct because it also is allowed in the MSR zone. Okay. So, yeah. so I, oh, I, I forgot about That's that. A, so I, you, you can I see that. I was going to add there. it to the MSR if it wasn't. <laughs> so they're allowed in the MSR like area of the like Main Street Business District zone um, and the residential R8. So That's why it was on there. I was right, thinking of Andrea. Right. So the, these, two, these first two points really are probably going to uh, determine more of the spatial type of, of requirements. So basically location, detached accessory dwelling units shall only be allowed in the rear yard of a single family dwelling. Detached accessory dwelling units cannot be subdivided from the primary dwelling and cannot be sold separately from the primary dwelling. Either the primary dwelling or the detached accessory dwelling unit need to be owner occupied. Detached accessory dwelling units cannot be leased for a term longer than two years without a renewal agreement. Size and setbacks. The maximum footprint of a de detached accessory dwelling unit shall be 800 square feet. The maximum square footage of a detached accessory dwelling unit shall be 1,600 square feet. The maximum height of a detached accessory dwelling unit shall not exceed the height of the primary dwelling unit or 24 feet, whichever is less. The setbacks of a detached accessory dwelling unit shall be at least 12 feet from the primary dwelling and 8 feet from the side and rear property lines. This process, yeah. yeah. If they, this, it doesn't matter what size it is, as long as months. they can meet setbacks and fit that in there. Mm -hmm. I, could, I think the size of the property will dictate itself just with setbacks. 
Yeah. Because a lot of properties, like, they might That's have a weird shape that they can fit that in because mm -hmm. of their size of the lot, but it might only be so many thousand feet. And I guess one thing more I should add. Does it define is, how is far away is, is yeah. part of that spatial? They have to have two, and it can't be tandem. Mm -hmm. Two off street. I think it's great. I have mm -hmm. Does I it define how far well. far from the main unit it has 12. to be? 12, 12 feet, feet from the main house. Oh, the, the unit itself, 12 yeah. feet from the primary door. Okay, I got yeah. you. So I see it now. And that's pretty much fire code. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then yeah. it can't be higher than the original house or yeah. anything like that. So if so. you need setbacks, that's going to dictate whether you can do it or not. Yeah. So well, we should set one well side. So if you open it up to the entire residential on. area yeah. of the yeah, city. Then. The so it also says that it has to somewhat mesh with the existing home. You can't have some... It's not some random, ridiculous, ugly thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, this this is an article I, I I had that will show you some more examples of, of what they look like and, and kind of what they. Those mm -hmm. mini homes are popular. Mm -hmm. And these are obviously pretty small lots. I think I think this article talks about them in like uh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. So you can see that. I mean, I I don't know what the setbacks and stuff are, but you can see that in in some cases they even almost become like a. Uh, kind of a detached extension of the home they look just like mm -hmm. it and mm -hmm. and uh in, in a lot of ways you know some people who are maybe uh, a little bit cautious or or initially um push back on on this idea i mean I, I don't see what the difference is between a a an addition to the home for you know a new master suite with mm -hmm. a bathroom and 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 uh you know a, a big closet and, and a new master bedroom that's attached to the home and this the, which is detached by 12 feet so um yeah this just more but to examples your 20 for something you. year old kid it means a lot well i was also <laughs> thinking about sheds i mean what are the shed setbacks because i i want to oh they feet, three feet three feet, three feet, feet from each yeah. side and then how far from your dwelling i think it's 12 feet be. as well as mm -hmm. fire yeah okay so yeah. yeah fire code okay. is any so you can't just turn your shed building. into it because it has yeah. to be eight feet <laughs> So Not to be three. clear, the it can be a minimum of mm -hmm. three feet as long as you have a, a fire-resistant fire wall. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the minimum you could go, but I think the standard setback is more like five feet, uh, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. okay. So the consensus is this is a good idea? I think so. Yes. I think yeah. it's a nice... Easy so, way of helping solve the housing thing without putting in more. I, like yeah. I think it's good, but we happen. need. Yeah. We would, when you watch, I think we need more restriction on it. I, I know it. it's my yeah. entire family. They're struggling like crazy. So hard. I think it should be allowed anywhere that it'll fit. Just yep. as long as it's got the yeah. setbacks and the and all distance. of that's spelled out already. So, and like I say, maybe I as we look this at this, we can like we can provide a little bit more clarification on things. You know, carports or or things like that. Or maybe we want to get more specific with parking to make sure that it's off the street. I mean, it has to be off the street. It says off street, not tandem. So I don't know how more specific you can get. I just right. wonder. I mean, I wonder if we should put some sort of size regulation on it, just so you don't have size regulation on the what on the lot, just so everything's just not crumpled in. So I, well, you can because of setbacks. Right. But it's eight feet off of the property line, right? And then 12 mm -hmm. feet away from the house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they have I to don't... be able to fit no more than 800 they, square feet. They, and they have to have the two car that's spots. That's like 28 I know, but tops. don't you just feel like everything is just going to be it's packed gonna, I feel like this is a slippery matter. slope if we just open it's it maybe, up. Maybe I feel like it would be yeah. better to have it be like 10,000 square feet or more. Like I, at I least a quarter acre or a third acre or more. Because if the main home is not that big and they want to put one the same size but behind the front, it makes it their property. I'm, I'm with you. Is there, um, the, do they have an architectural the... code with it that they'd have to abide by? Yeah. So yeah. I, you don't want like a. We mentioned the bright... design, the architectural style and color of a detached accessory dwelling unit shall be compared. So it shall be comparable, sorry, compatible with the primary dwelling and approved by the zoning administrator. I think you just mm -hmm. need to give us time to next meeting to let the, all these people um, review all this mm -hmm. and look at it and bring it back with a, a proposed ordinance for all zones. And let us uh, give you some feedback then. Okay. Because um, we've already hashed this out mm -hmm. at right. one point, the, but the newer ones have not. So, um, yeah. You have okay. to abide by all building codes and everything. This makes well, sense. Well, I, I will work on, and really it'll be a simple draft ordinance because based on what you're so, saying. So is there anything in there about the ADU being smaller than the uh, main house? The main dwelling. Yes. We just did a square footage, so I think we had that conversation when this was all right. being so, discussed. So but then I think we just said, 
You don't like, want the ADU being huge and the main dwelling being a small older home. You know? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if we have same. too many 800 square foot. Uh, or uh, I should there say, might be five. There could be yeah. <laughs> footprints yeah. that are 800 square feet. I do know some people that have garages bigger than their house. Yeah. Yeah. I want. But they also are like on an acre, town? so it doesn't yeah. really yeah. matter. Any complaints about them? Uh, sometimes it's it's mostly the neighbor that would complain about them because they feel like like someone is like overlooking their backyard because the setbacks are less. Have you had complaints? Because I know these exist in depth. We, uh, I wouldn't say we have specific complaints about someone living in, in one of these, but if, if someone has a, a larger accessory building that's being built, it blocks like their view. pretty close to the property line, like three feet away, 24 feet tall, then sometimes we'll get complaints about that where people don't like the idea of, of I mean, the existing ones. Have you had complaints about the existing ones? No, okay. I've. I, I, I don't know of any. And by existing ones, I don't I don't really know about them unless someone calls and complains. So, <laughs> no, I have not any complaints because I don't even know. Unless someone called me, I wouldn't even know about them. Well, that's a good discussion. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. I'll put, to, I, based on the comments I'm hearing, I'll put together a, 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 a quick little draft and it'll be kind of a. And we'll, we'll, we'll uh, set a public hearing and it'll be a good launching pad to. To look at this a little bit more in depth next time. I think uh, it was said already, but yeah, for those that might not be as familiar with our current regulations or even just familiar with them in general, yeah, re read this section mm -hmm. of code or, or feel free to give me a call and I'm happy to talk um, more about these. I think I, I covered covered it pretty good tonight, but uh, there's obviously a, a lot to these that, that, that might be not the most familiar to you. Okay. So we don't need a motion on that. That was just basically mm -mm. discussion, right? No, not really. I, I got your direction. Okay, so agenda item number seven, uh, we'll discuss our meeting minutes from June 14th. Did anybody read those and want to make a motion? Okay, Commissioner Romero. Can I make a motion that we approve the June 14th, 2022 meeting minutes of the Santa Quinn Planning Commission? Okay, very good. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner Hoffman. Okay, does this require a roll call vote? Yes. Okay, Commissioner Lance, aye. Commissioner Nixon, aye. Commissioner McNuff, aye. Commissioner Waite, aye. Commissioner Romero, aye. Commissioner Hoffman, aye. Is there any other business that you have for us? Yeah, I, I just got like 10 items to cover. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, you gotta get me some shirts. I've been yawning I'm like crazy here. Items. I'm ready for bed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything more. <laughs> All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I have a motion to adjourn. Thank you so much. So moved. Okay.